Welcome to chapter 12 and Things Fall Apart. In this chapter we're going to see the engagement ceremony of Oconquo's friend Obierka's daughter. You may remember a few chapters back they negotiated her bride price using bundles of sticks. And now it's time for the suitor to bring pots of palm wine um, to Obierka's house and Obierka's wife, um, the mother of the daughter who's getting married, She's invited a bunch of ladies from the neighborhood to come and cook, and so they're going to feast and celebrate this, um, this union, this marriage. On the following morning, the entire neighborhood wore a festive air because Akonko's friend, Obierka, was celebrating his daughter's Uri. And we can flip to the back of the book, to the glossary, and find out that Uri is a part of the betrothal ceremony when the dowry is paid. Now, to be betrothed means that you're engaged, and a dowry is just um, some like a gift that the the father of the bride gives to the future husband. It was the day on which her suitor, having already paid the greater part of her bride price, would bring palm wine not only to her parents and immediate relatives, but to the wide and extensive group of kinsmen called Umana. Everybody had been invited, men, women, and children, but it was really a woman's ceremony, and the central figures were the bride and her mother. As soon as day broke, breakfast was hastily eaten, and women and children began to gather at Obierka's compound to help the bride's mother in her difficult but happy task of cooking for a whole village. Akonkwo's family was astir like any other family in the neighborhood. Nwoye's mother and Akonkwo's youngest wife were ready to set out for Obierka's compound with all their children. Nwoye's mother carried a basket of cocoa yams, a cake of salt, and smoked fish, which she would present to Obierka's wife. Akonkwo's youngest wife, Ojugo, also had a basket of plantains and cocoa yams and a small pot of palm oil. Their children carried pots of water. Akwefi was tired and sleepy from the exhausting experiences of the previous night. It was not very long since they had returned. The priestess with the Zinma sleeping on her back had crawled out of the shrine on her belly like a snake. She had not as much looked at Akonkwo and Akwefi or shown any surprise at finding them at the mouth of the cave. She looked straight ahead of her and walked back to the village. Akonkwo and his wife followed at a respectful distance. They thought the priestess might be going to her house, but she went to Akonkwo's compound, passed through his obi, and into Akwefi's hut and walked into her bedroom. She placed a zinma carefully on the bed and went away without saying a word to anybody. Azinma was still sleeping when everyone else was astir, and Akwefi asked Nawoye's mother and Ojiugo to explain to Obierka's wife that she would be late. She had got ready her basket of cocoa yams and fish, but she must wait for Azinma to wake. You need some sleep yourself, said Nawoye's mother. You look very tired. As they spoke, Azinma emerged from the hut, rubbing her eyes and stretching her spare frame. She saw the other children with their water pots and remembered that they were going to fetch water for Obierka's wife. She went back to the hut and brought her pot. Have you slept enough? asked her mother. Yes, she replied. Let us go. Not before you have had your breakfast, said Akwefi, and she went into her hut to warm the vegetable soup she had cooked last night. So not exactly a traditional Westerner's breakfast, um, but they're going to have some vegetable soup to eat. We shall be going, said Nawoye's mother. I will tell Obierka's wife that you are coming later. And so they all went to help Obierka's wife. Nawoye's mother with her four children, and Ojugo with her two. As they trooped through Akonkwo's obi, he asked, Who will prepare my afternoon meal? I shall return to do it, said Ojugo. Akonkwo was also feeling tired and sleepy, for although nobody else knew it, he had not slept at all last night. He had felt very anxious, but did not show it. When Akwefi had followed the priestess, he had allowed for what he regarded as a reasonable and manly interval to pass, and then gone with his machete to the shrine, where he thought they must be. It was only when he got there that it had occurred to him that the priestess might have chosen to go round the villages first. Akonkwo had returned home and sat waiting. When he thought he had waited long enough, he again returned to the shrine, but the hills and the caves were as silent as death. It was only on his fourth trip that he had found Akwefi, and by then he had become gravely worried. So that shows you how much he cares about um, Azinma and his wife Akwefi. Obierka's compound was as busy as an anthill. 
Temporary cooking tripods were erected on every available space by bringing together three blocks of sun-dried earth and making a fire in their midst. Cooking pots went up and down the tripods, and fufu was pounded in a hundred wooden mortars. Some of the women cooked the yams and the cassava, and others prepared vegetable soup. Young men pounded the fufu or split firewood. The children made endless trips to the stream. Three young men helped Obierica to slaughter the two goats with which the soup was made. They were very fat goats, but the fattest of all was tethered to a peg near the wall of the compound. It was as big as a small cow. Obierica had sent one of his relatives all the way to Umuike to buy that goat. It was the one he would present alive to his in-laws. The market of Umuike is a wonderful place, said the young man who had been sent by Obierica to buy the giant goat. There are so many people on it that if you threw up a grain of sand, it would not find a way to fall to earth again. It is the result of a great medicine, said Obierka. The people of Umuike wanted their market to grow and swallow up the markets of their neighbors, so they made a powerful medicine. Every market day before the first cock crow, this medicine stands on the market ground in the shape of an old woman with a fan. With this magic fan, she beckons to the market all the neighboring clans. She beckons in front of her and behind her, to her right and to her left. And so everybody comes, said another man, honest men and thieves. They can steal your cloth from off your waist in that market. Yes, said Obierka. I warned in one goat to keep a sharp eye and a sharp ear. There was once a man who went to sell a goat. He led it on a thick rope which he tied round his wrist. But as he walked through the market, he realized that people were pointing at him as they do a madman. He could not understand it until he looked back and saw that what he led at the end of the tether was not a goat, but a heavy log of wood. Do you think a thief can do that kind of thing single-handed? asked Nwanko. No, said Obierka. They use medicine. When they had cut the goat's throats, and collected the, the blood in a bowl, they held them over an open fire to burn off the hair, and the smell of burning hair blended with the smell of cooking. Then they washed them and cut them up for the women who prepared the soup. All this ant hill activity was going smoothly when a sudden interruption came. It was a cry in the distance, Oji Oru Achi Ijiji O O! The one that uses its tail to drive flies away. Every woman immediately abandoned whatever she was doing and rushed out in the direction of the cry. We cannot all rush out like that, leaving what we are cooking to burn in the fire, shouted Chielo, the priestess. Three or four of us should stay behind. It is true, said another woman. We will allow three or four women to stay behind. Five women stayed behind to look after the cooking pots, and all the rest rushed away to see the cow that had been let loose. When they saw it, they drove it back to its owner, who at once paid the heavy fine which the village imposed on anyone whose cow was let loose on his neighbor's crops. When the women had, exa had exacted the penalty, they checked among themselves to see if any woman had failed to come out when the cry had been raised. This is an important story. It shows you the community spirit that they have. It shows you the role that the women are playing in this particular situation. Um, it also shows you that they are very considerate of their neighbor's crops. So if a cow gets out and starts chewing up a neighbor's crops, that means that the neighbor has less to eat. And so a very hefty fine is, um, is enforced to keep that kind of situation from happening very often. And then they also are looking around to see who didn't come help, which tells you the importance of everybody rushing to, to provide aid. Where is Imbogo? asked one of them. She is ill in bed, said Imbogo's next door neighbor. She has Iba. The only other person is Udenquo, said another woman, and her child is not 28 days yet. Those women whom Obierka's wife had not asked to help her with the cooking returned to their homes and the rest went back in a body to Obierka's compound. Whose cow was it? asked the women who had been allowed to stay behind. It was my husband's, said Ezelabo. One of the young children had opened the gate of the cow shed. Early in the afternoon, the first two pots of palm wine arrived from Obierka's in-laws. They were duly presented to the women who drank a cup or two each to help them in their cooking. Some of it also went to the bride and her attendant maidens who were putting the last delicate touches of razor to her coiffure and camwood on her smooth skin. So they're painting the, 
the future bride's body, and they're doing her hair as well. That's what coiffure means. When the heat of the sun began to soften, Obiericus's son Maduka took a long broom and swept the ground in front of his father's Obi. And as if they had been waiting for that, Obiericus's relatives and friends began to arrive. Every man with his goatskin bag hung on one shoulder and a rolled goatskin mat under his arm. Some of them were accompanied by their sons bearing carved wooden stools. A conqua was one of them. They sat in a half circle and began to talk of many things. It would not be long before the suitors came. Akonkwo brought out his snuff bottle and offered it to Agbuefi Azenwa, who sat next to him. Azenwa took it, tapped it on his kneecap, rubbed his left palm on his body to dry it before tipping a little snuff into it. His actions were deliberate, and as he spoke, he performed them. I hope our in-laws will bring many pots of wine. Although they come from a village that is known for being close-fisted, they ought to know that Akueke is the bride for a king. And close-fisted just means that you're stingy. They dare not bring fewer than thirty pots, said Akonkwo. I shall tell them my mind if they do. At that moment, Obierka's son, Maduka, led out the giant goat from the inner compound for his father's relatives to see. They all admired it and said that that was the way things should be done. The goat was then led back to the inner compound. Very soon after, the in-laws began to arrive. Young men and boys in single file, each carrying a pot of wine, came first. Obierka's relatives counted the pots as they came. Twenty, twenty-five. There was a long break, and the hosts looked at each other as if to say, I told you. Then more pots came. Thirty, thirty-five, forty, forty-five. The hosts nodded in approval and seemed to say, Now they are behaving like men. Altogether, there were fifty pots of wine. After the pot-bearers came Ibe, the suitor, and the elders of his family. They sat in a half-moon, thus completing a circle with their hosts. The pots of wine stood in their midst. Then the bride, her mother, and half a dozen other women and girls emerged from the inner compound and went round the circle shaking hands with all. The bride's mother led the way, followed by the bride and the other women. The married women wore their best clothes, and the girls wore red and black waist beads and anklets of brass. When the women retired, Obierica presented cola nuts to his in-laws. His eldest brother broke the first one. Life to all of us, he said as he broke it, and let there be friendship between your family and ours. The crowd answered, Eee, eh, eh, eh. We are giving you our daughter today. She will be a good wife to you. She will bear you nine sons like the mother of our town. Eee, eh, eh. The oldest man in the camp of the visitors replied, It will be good for you, and it will be good for us. Eee, eh, eh. This is not the first time my people have come to marry your daughter. My mother was one of you. Eee, eh, eh. And this will not be the last, because you understand us, and we understand you. You are a great family. Eee, eh, eh. Prosperous men and great warriors. He looked in the direction of a conquo. Your daughter will bear us sons like you. Eee, eh, eh. The cola was eaten, and the drinking of palm wine began. Groups of four or five men sat round with a pot in their midst. As the evening wore on, food was presented to the guests. There were huge bowls of fufu and steaming pots of soup. There was also pots of yam pottage. It was a great feast. As night fell, burning torches were set on wooden tripods, and the young men raised a song. The elders sat in a big circle, and the singers went round, singing each man's praise as they came before him. They had something to say for every man. Some were great farmers, some were orators who spoke for the clan. A conqua was the greatest wrestler and warrior alive. When they had gone round the circle, they settled down in the center, and girls came from the inner compound to dance. At first the bride was not among them, but when she finally appeared holding a cock in her right hand, a loud cheer rose from the crowd. All the other dancers made way for her. She presented the cock to the mus musicians and began to dance. Her brass anklets rattled as she danced, and her body gleamed with cam wood in the soft yellow light. The musicians, with their wood, clay, and metal instruments, went from song to song, and they were all gay. They sang the latest song in the village. If I hold her hand, she says don't touch. If I hold her foot, she says don't touch. But when I hold her waist beads, she pretends not to know. 
The night was already far spent when the guests rose to go, taking their bride home to spend seven market weeks with her suitor's family. They sang songs as they went, and on their way they paid short courtesy visits to prominent men like Aconquo before they finally left for their village. Aconquo made a present of two cocks to them. So we get to see a lot about their culture here in this one chapter, and um, I'm wondering what you think about the bride going to spend seven market weeks with the suitor's family before they get married. I wonder what that might be about. We'll talk about it in class. Next time we're going to get into chapter 13.